All right, so this is block day. This is free response, uh, topic four. We did number one yesterday. We'll do number two right now. And then when I finish number two, I will let you do uh, number three and four together. <coughs> All right, the tank has a height. You know what? Let's back up a second say some of the things we said yesterday. Anytime you see a table, cover up everything else. Anytime you see a table, your brain should probably start thinking, um, probably going to ask me something about a Riemann sum. Right? So left, right, who knows? So Riemann sum, uh, left bound, or a left hand sum, a right hand sum, a midpoint sum, a trapezoid sum. Um, probably not going to be a midpoint sum with only four pieces of data here. So probably left or right or trapezoid. In fact, Part A, I don't even know what this problem is, but there's use a left ream on sum. Um, sometimes they'll do average rate of change because you can't do you can't do a derivative, you can't do an instantaneous rate of change, but you can do an average rate of change, like estimate a derivative. Um, and then sometimes that leads to an instantaneous rate of change, MVT. So those are the things I'm thinking about when I see a table. All right, so let's read this problem and see if some of those things show up. A tank has a height of 10 feet. The area of the horizontal cross section of the tank at h feet is given by the function a, where a is measured in square feet. The function a is continuous and decreases as h increases. So I don't know what this tank looks like, but at the bottom, um, it's really big. And then at the top, it's really small. So, I mean, who knows? It's probably not that, but something along those lines where we're our, when our height is zero, our cross-sectional area is 50. When our height is two, like, I know this is exactly what's in the table, but I'm trying to like, just make sense of the problem for me. Okay, so that's what the tank maybe looks like. It's certainly getting uh, narrower as we increase. Part A, use a left Riemann sum with three subintervals. Well, yes, because that's the only way we could do it. Three subintervals using the data in the table to approximate the volume of the tank. Okay, so the volume of the tank would be, um, okay, area times height. That would give us a volume. So <coughs> the area, the first area, so if we're doing a left-hand sum, is 50.3. What should we use for the height for that area? Be careful, this is where we want the width of that. Like we're going to say this, this entire height is 2, and we're going to use that area. So the width is 2, and we'll use the left-hand height. Well, that's a weird way to say that. The left-hand area. Plus the next height, or the next area is 14.4. And how wide is that we're going to use 2 or 5 or 3. Yeah, 3 from 2 to 5. So the area is 14.4. The height of that interval, or the width of that interval, is 3. And then the last one is 6.5 times 5. Uh, and even though this is with calculator, like that's a safe stop. So we can, we can just be done there. Um, Indicate units of measure. Well, volume should definitely be uh, three units, right? Length times width times height. And sure enough, if we're multiplying area square feet times feet, that would be feet cubed. So somehow indicates that our area, excuse me, our volume is whatever that is, feet cubed. Part B, 
does the approximation in part A overestimate or underestimate the volume of the tank? Explain your reasoning. Let's see. This is decreasing. Uh, I don't have those memorized. I like have to draw the picture here. So if we have a decreasing function and we're using our left hand limits, what's my answer? It's got to be over. So we need to say overestimate because let me say a left hand sum or a left Riemann sum or a left hand sum or even just a left sum left Riemann sum of a decreasing function is over. And so they would be looking for, the words those graders would be looking for is left Riemann sum combined with decreasing, that's going to make an overestimate. C. Okay, that everybody should get those two parts. Like that should be easy peasy right there. So hopefully that's enough to get us a kind of on pace for a three. Part C. The area in square feet of the horizontal cross sections is modeled by the function, this thing. Based on this model, find the volume of the tank. Okay, so we've already thought about we're integrating, let's see, this is the area times the the, the height, or the little height, um, the piece of the height that goes with it. So when we had a table, we did the Riemann sum. Now we've got a function. Let's see, I need my limits. Um, I guess it goes from 0 to 10. So 0 to 10 of that function. Because that function tells me the height. Find the units, um, indicate units of measure. That's going to be feet cubed again. This is a calculator question, so grab the calculator. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I want to type that in for y1, or if I want to just type all that in for the integral. And it kind of depends on how often I need it. I don't know. I'm going to type it in for y1 because I might need it for for part d. Point three over e to the point two x plus x. <coughs> e to the point two x plus x. Yes. Okay. Oh, I don't really want to graph. Oh no, I've got what you guys have. When the batteries are so low, it keeps shutting off on you. E to the point two X plus X. Okay. Math nine. Zero to ten. Hundred and one. So hundred one point three two five. Always three decimal places. Feet cubed. Um, now I am curious. I want to compare that. Like I feel like my two answers should be in the same like ballpark, like C and answer A. So now I'm going to go back and see what answer A is. It's 176. That's pretty significantly over C, but. That's okay because we, we already said it was an overestimate and with only four data points, um, I don't expect it to be too accurate. So I feel okay about my answer to C. Now answer D. Water is pumped into the tank. 
when the height of the water is 5 feet, the height is increasing at a rate. So when h equals 5, the height is increasing at a rate. So that's dh dt. It's 0.26 feet per minute. Using the model from part C, okay, so I'm glad I typed in Y1 already. Find the rate at which the volume of water is changing with respect to time. So find dV dt when h is 5. Units of measure. You know, I can do units right now because dV <coughs> over dt, dV is feet cubed and t is in minutes so if they're kind enough to give me a point for the units I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and grab that point right now okay so we said the volume was the integral from 0 to 10 but I'm gonna say 0 to h because uh, it depends on how high we are of y1 dt. Nope, dh. Sorry. That's what we just did. So if we want dv dt, I need to take a derivative of that thing. So there's my dv dt. And then I want the derivative of the antiderivative. So what's going on here? What's the derivative of the antiderivative? Back to y1. Now I need to be careful here. Um, y1, we plug in h, so y1 at 5 in this case. Um, but there's a chain rule thing times dh dt. Uh, we ran into this yesterday as well. Related rates, chain rule. If you were taking it a derivative with respect to h, then you wouldn't have to worry about it, but you're taking it with respect to t. But this was a pretty big clue when they gave you dh dt. So the answer is going to be y1 at 5 times 0.26. And let's make sure that comes out to feet cube per minute. Y1 is in feet squared, but dH dt is feet per minute. So yeah, that's going to turn out to be feet cubed per minute. So now I just need to evaluate Y1 at 5 with the calculator that has a functional battery. Y1 at 5 times 0.26. 1.694 feet cubed per minute. Uh, the only thing I'm a little nervous about is I keep using y1 and I don't know that I ever said what y1 is equal to. So somewhere I would need to say y1 is equal to what they called f of h. And now it's clear uh, that I've used everything the right way. You know, that was pretty similar to the last one we saw like that. That's a fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, you don't have to know the rules. But that idea of the derivative of an integral gets you back to the original, but then also related rates, plugging in all the right stuff. Um, also, if you take a look at our time here, we're at 14 minutes. So these problems really are designed to take 15 minutes. Um, I don't know. I, I spent some time explaining on that, but... So you could go a little faster. If you didn't know it, you might go a little slower. What we haven't done and what I want to do on this one is to look at the scoring guideline. So this was 2017 number one. So I'm just going to show you how to do that because all of these are old um, tests. And so the answers are posted in my Google Drive. But if you want to see how the scoring breakdown goes, you just go get a... Google's spot somewhere and 
Let's see, this was 2017. Uh, AP Calculus Scoring Guideline. Again, these are usually publicly posted. 2000 AP Calculus Scoring Guidelines. AP Calculus AB Scoring Guideline 2017. Now I'll have to go find it. There it is. It must have been question one. compare what we did. So part A was, um, oh, you get one point for getting all of the units right. That's interesting. So that is very interesting. That means if you skipped part D because you thought, oh, that's too hard, then you missed out on getting a, an easy unit part. So again, try everything you can. And even if we'd have just got the units on part D, and A and C, that was worth one point. So hopefully everybody can get that point. Okay, so left Riemann sum and the approximation. Um, goodness, so did you have to leave a... I, I'm not sure if you safe stopped it, what the difference between these two would be, is my only thought on that. So maybe with a calculator it would be wise to go ahead and find that answer. Okay, yeah, we got 176.3. I remember that. That's looking at my calculator over here. So there's two points. Part B was fairly easy. It was an overestimate, a left ream on sum, and A is decreasing. So that was only worth a point. Um, okay, so I'm going to argue that there are four points to be had here that were pretty easy points. The ream on sum, the overestimate, and the units, all that together gets four points. 4 out of 9 is 44. That's like the minimum score for a 3. So hopefully you knock out those two and you're on track for a 3. Maybe we can figure out a little bit more. Um, two points for part C. One for the integral, one for the answer. Again, because you can't just safe stop the integral. That's what we got for C. And then D. Um, that was a little bit weird, but there's what we wrote. Um, can, they showed their work a little bit differently, but we did the same thing and we got that as an answer, so we would be okay. Um, yeah, if that last part was hard, that's if you only did, if the last part was the only part you didn't get, that's six out of nine. That's a that's a really strong four. So again, you don't have to be perfect on these things. Like get some points, get as many as you can, um, but. You don't have to be perfect by any means to get a 3 or a 4, really even a 5. <coughs> okay, so your assignment today is on separate paper, turn in before you leave. Turn in before you leave. And we've still got an hour left or so. so we've got plenty of time to do this. Um, so free response, topic four, number three and four. So nice and neat, separate paper. <coughs> neat, uh, work shown, not walk shown, work shown. Um, and each student, one submission per student, right? Like you can work together. Also, kind of typing this out because I'll leave it for the sub for tomorrow. Work together, but each student submits their work. All right, is that, is that clear? So, separate piece of paper. By all means, work together. But each person needs to have their stuff submitted and submitted neat, work shown, right? Don't just copy the answer and write, you know, 1.7 and 2.5 and stuff like that. 